All right, thank you very much. Uh, I think what we're going to do is we're going to start off where each of the sides will give a 12 minute or so, um, what I would call introductory remarks. And after that, uh, there are going to be a series of questions back and forth, an opportunity for a discussion uh, with the three of us. And then we're going to open it up uh, to the general audience. We want this to be an ongoing conversation uh, with everyone here. So, and uh, the format I think will allow us to do that. So I'm just gonna turn, you know, I'm sure the positions that are gonna be taken here are gonna be nuanced, so we're gonna hear how it plays out. But I'm gonna start with you, John, and then I'm gonna turn over to John. <laughs> right, and we'll go there, all right. <laughs> you want to go first? Do you wanna go first? Do you? Uh, it doesn't matter. To, uh, okay, do you wanna go first, John? Okay, um, please. Okay. H, is, H is before Y? Right, okay. Okay. Thank you, and I especially wanna thank G Day for taking on the task of telling us apart. You have two law professors from state law schools, both who do structural constitutional law, former deputies in the Office of Legal Counsel, um, both graduates of the Yale Law School. So essentially indistinguishable. <laughs> and hence the challenge is, is right. being able to distinguish us. I'm, I, I think I'm, though, I'm going to differ from John Yu on the allocation of constitutional power between Congress and the president. My position, you might say, is so pro-Congress, it is pro-President. And I hope that'll come out in the next couple of minutes as I sort of take my, explain my basic view, which is the power to declare war, which the Constitution allocates to Congress, gives Congress complete control over, question, over the question whether the use of military force in any circumstance is on behalf of the United States as a sovereign and is in that respect, which is extremely important, lawful. The power to declare war, as, was, as it was understood in the 18th century, I think, had two components. One was the power to make the old style formal declaration of war, where a herald shows up somewhere and blows a trumpet and says, war is hereby declared, a purely juridical act. And I think most people who study the Constitution agree that the power to do that is clearly in Congress. Congress can, it legislates, it does that sort of thing, it takes purely juridical acts, and one of the purely juridical acts it can take is a declaration of war like that. The thing that I think people tend to lose sight of, and I don't think is often, is always appreciated, was not fully appreciated often, I think in the 18th century, is there was another component of the power to declare war. And if you read Cy Prakash and Mike Ramsey, one of the things you'll learn is they said in the 18th century that the king of England or Great Britain could declare war out of the cannon's mouth which meant the war started when the attack began. Now, what did that mean? It didn't mean that the king lit the fuse on the cannon. He wasn't actually physically present. What it meant, what made the use of military force an act of war that would create a juridical state of war between Great Britain and some other sovereign, was authorization by the sovereign to use force. And that is what the king of Great Britain could do not because he was the commander in chief of the British military, but because he was the sovereign, because he was the person who made the decision, is this on behalf of a government? Uses of force on behalf of, but not on behalf of a government, as Blackstone, when he talked about this point, described them, the acts of mere pirates and robbers, not what we would call privileged combatants in the 21st century. So that determination was with the sovereign, that is the king, the framers divided up the various powers of sovereignty and gave the vast bulk of them to Congress. One of them they gave to Congress was the power to declare war, and hence the power to decide, is this an authorized use of force on behalf of the United States as a sovereign? If it's not, as I say, pirates and robbers. No combatant privilege for the people who engage in those actions, and no obligation on the part of the members of the military to follow orders, because unlawful orders are not binding. That's the part that is very pro-Congress. The reason my view is in practice substantially pro-President is although I think that the use of force needs to be authorized by Congress, I think unlike many people who take a position that they would call pro-Congress, that can be done generically, it can be done in advance, and it can be done implicitly. So my view is the question of the authorization of the use of force 
is fundamentally a question of statutory construction. Congress has enacted statutes, setting up the military, saying a very little bit, disturbingly little, about what they are for, leaving to inference and implication the question, what is the role of the United States military? I would say it is to use armed force to further the national, the national interest and the national security of the United States. But those are questions of statutory construction. Ultimately, though, I think it's all up to Congress. I think there is no constitutional authority in the president as commander in chief. And when you think about this, and this is not something original with me, military commanders are subject to the law. Simply being a military commander doesn't bring with it any authority to decide whether some use of force is in fact on behalf of a sovereign. What the commander in chief clause means is civilian control over the military. It establishes what we call the principle of the unitary executive, and that's in the Sam Alito sense of who's in charge, not how extensive the authority is. It establishes the principle of the unitary executive for the military, puts the president in charge of the military to carry out the law as the president and the executive branch do everywhere else in their functions. We have a law-bound executive, a law-guided executive, an executive subject to the law. That's true in the military. That's also true in civilian operations. Some implications of what I have to say, as I say, these are all then questions of statutory construction. Um, Congress can give authorization in advance, as for example it did in the Insurrection Act, under which President Lincoln acted to put down the rebellion. Whether, interesting thing about the prize cases where that question came up, nine justices agreed that the use of force was okay on the basis of existing authorization. Four said only Congress could make the Confederates public enemies. That's the other part of the power to declare war, to create the juridical state of war other than the authorization of the use of force. I'm not sure what I think about that, but about using military force with combatant privilege, yes, that can be authorized in advance, it can be authorized generically, it can be limited in advance and generically. Therefore, for example, the 60-day clock in the War Powers Resolution is fine. It comes from the power to declare war. It doesn't have to come from any of the other Congre powers Congress has. It's not, it doesn't have to take the form of an appropriations restriction because Congress controls when the use of force is on behalf of the United States as a, statu as a sovereign. The last thing I'll say, and this is about a, a forgotten or largely forgotten episode in American constitutional history that I think is extremely important. Another implication of what I think, these are questions of statutory construction, Congress can act prospectively, Congress can act generically, is that Congress acted constitutionally in 1945 when it adopted the UN Participation Act and authorized the President to enter into agreements under Article 43 of the UN Charter with the Security Council that would provide that United States military forces would be available on the call of the Security Council. The agreements, the UN Participation Act said, had to be approved by joint resolution, that is an act of Congress, but once an agreement had been approved, then force could be used and no further act of Congress, no further declaration of war was necessary. There was a debate about that in 1945. Is that consistent with the power of Congress to declare war? Majority in Congress said, yes it is. There's congressional authorization here. It's an advance. That is enough. So that's why I think the UN Participation Act is fine. And also think, as I say, that the 60-day limitation in the War Powers Resolution is fine. Both of those are exercises of, of power I think the Constitution vests in Congress. And here, and, and John and I were talking about this a little bit, I'm, what I'm saying is somewhat heretical for a former OLC deputy, so I will at least conclude with a word that, that we used to love in OLC, although I'm going to apply it to the other branch, because the general principle is that Congress's control over whether the use of force is authorized on behalf of the United States of a sovereign as a sovereign is plenary. Thank you. Uh, John? Thank you. I also want to thank uh, the Federal Society and G-Day uh, and John for uh, putting together this panel. Uh, I have to say I'm very uncomfortable being here because uh, I don't like sitting in these easy chairs. This is something demanded by the once formalist John Harrison, who as you can tell has turned into complete functionalist, only interested in comfort and easygoing nature and is not the man he once was. So I will... <laughs> make the John Harrison case circa 1980s against John Harrison of the 21st century. 
So those of you who know and love John Harrison as uh, I do know that he is a close and careful textualist. And I would say one thing that I didn't hear about much was the meaning of the terms declare war compared to other clauses in the Constitution. I, I, we we're both going to bring out our con now. <laughs> mine, however, is not approved by you know economic megaliths like Lexis Nexus. Mine is a Federal Society copy. <laughs> so it's, it's pandering to the audience, it's called. So. Let's assume declare war, John says, let's look at what I think declare war means based on contemporary colloquial uses of the phrase, which, as he said, side precaution, uh, Mike Ramsey have also done a fairly comprehensive look at what did people mean, think declare war meant when they were writing in letters, speeches of the time. But I would think the thing that would take precedence first would be what does declare war appear to mean in the Constitution itself before you get to uses of history, and I thought that's what John Harrison did. He has this great article about the meaning of the Privileges and Immunities Clause and the Equal Protection Clause, where he looks carefully at the phrases of the text of the Constitution itself, before looking at uh, doctrine and history and so on. So assume Article 1, Section 8, declare war. We're not sure exactly whether it means beginning hostilities, which I think is what John thinks it means, or just a juridical statement, a declaration of the state of US relations with another country. So take a look at another clause, Article 1, Section 10. And the third paragraph, which talks about uh, states and their right to use force. So here it says, no state shall, without the consent of Congress, engage in war unless actually invaded or in such imminent dangers will not admit of delay. Is that not exactly the war powers distribution of authority that John just argued for? Right? Instead of the state, substitute the president. The president cannot use force without the consent of Congress. And then the two exceptions most people agree with, unless we're actually invaded or there's some kind of imminent attack, imminent threat, and you can't get permission from Congress. So why would the framers have wrapped that whole system up into the word declare war in Article 1, Section 8, when in Article 1, Section 10, they were extremely precise and nuanced, G Day's favorite word, nuanced about exactly what conditions you could approve for force, and it says who does it, right? Congress gives its consent. So I, I would say if you were going to be a textualist, which we all are, uh, being Federalists, right? Wouldn't we have to find some difference in meaning between the declare war clause in Article 1, Section 8 and the division of authority with the commander in chief clause in Article 2, and then the way the text talks about the division between Congress and the states? So that's point one. The second point, again, Harrison, well known for looking at uh, constitutional practice of the states. Again, his famous article on the 14th Amendment. What about state practice at this time, right? Did any of the states use the phrase declare war in their own constitutions when they're limiting the power of the governors who are almost regularly called commander in chief of the armed forces? No. In fact, I think at the time there's only one state constitution, South Carolina, and I think we're all still not sure whether we should have added them to the union in the first place. But South Carolina, I think, is the only state constitution which talks about the power of the legislature to declare war as some kind of check on the executive. No other state constitution does so. Isn't that odd? Wouldn't you think that if this meaning of declare war had such a contempor contemporaneous colloquial meaning of starting hostilities that you would see it regularly used in other important legal documents of the time. I, I, you, just, you just don't have it. <clears throat> Third, think about what declarations of war were. If you were a framer in the <clears throat> late 18th century, what would have been the most, the most important declaration of war that you would know about? The Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence is a declaration of war. If you actually look at it, it is very similar to English declarations of war. When did hostility start in the Revolutionary War? None of my students at Berkeley know this anymore. Lexington and Concord, right? 1775. When's the Declaration of Independence issued? None of my students at Berkeley know this either. 
we can't put Independence Day as a federal holiday, so how would they learn? Um, July 4th, 1776. The Declaration comes about a year after hostilities start. Hostilities are authorized for the fighting starts. So one thing I also did when I did the research on this, many years before Harrison came along to it, is I tried to see when did the British issue a declaration of war compared to when did they start wars. So I looked at all the wars between about the century before the framing of the Constitution, and only one of, I think, 13 or 14 conflicts did the British issue a declaration before or at the same time as hostilities started. Usually, the declaration would come after. <coughs> after you'd had hostages, and declaration is almost like a complaint. It would say, this is what you did to us, this is what you have to do to make things up, we're gonna have a, we're gonna have a fight, and we're gonna declare all these legal statuses between us and you, and this is the condition you have to get to in order for the war to end. Right? It's a very juridical legal document, usually comes after the beginning of hostilities. Again, why would the framers have used declare war to mean start hostilities? I think you look at the Federalist Papers, or the debates in the, uh, convention, uh, in the state conventions, I'm sorry, where again, you don't see uh, the Federalists, defenders of the Constitution, when it was very much in their interest to do so, right? The anti-Federalists were attacking the Constitution for creating a presidency that was too powerful. You don't see people getting up and saying, don't worry about the president, because Congress has the power to declare war, they will limit the president, right? You don't really see that at the time of the framing. In fact, if there anything Hamilton says in the Federalist Papers, oh, the formality of declaring war has fallen out, has fallen into disuse, nobody does it anymore. And then I would point, last piece of historical evidence, I would point to uh, Harrison's state itself, the state of Virginia, which had probably the most important constitutional convention, state ratifying convention, because they were the state that basically put the Constitution over the top. Uh, they were the state that had the great uh, intellectual leaders of the revolution and the ratification in direct argument with each other. You never hear Madison say, uh, they, they never list the declare war clause as an important check by the president, of the Congress on the president. The main <clears throat> critic of the Constitution at the Virginia Convention is Patrick Henry, right? The give me liberty or give me death guy. And when you got to know him, you wanted to give him the latter, not the former. <laughs> Patrick Henry's big case against the Constitution was the presidency was created, was almost a pseudo monarchy. And he actually said, if you have a president, Congress grants him an army, there'll be no limit on what he can do. And Madison doesn't say, don't worry, there's a declare war clause. Instead, what Madison says in the Virginia Convention is, as it sits in England, it'll sit in the United States, and in England, the king may have the sword, but the parliament has the purse and it is funding that will be the main check on the, on the executive, not the declare war clause. Does he mention the declare war clause? When he had every incentive to mention it. So, but in the end, it kind of brings me around, since I still love John Harrison circa 1985 when he was <laughs> approving the bombing of Libya without congressional approval, or the invasion of Iraq without presidential approval. I love John Harrison of the 21st century too. So I'll close by saying, in the end, I think we agree on maybe not the origins of authority, but how it works out in contemporary cases. Because if John thinks that Congress has already implicitly authorized the use of force by uh, granting to the president this huge military, bigger than the next 15 countries combined, that is designed primarily for offensive operations, now, our military is called an expeditionary military by strategists because it is designed to fight countries, fight wars in other people's countries. Our military is not designed for homeland defense. So if John thinks that the creation, authorization, and funding of that huge offensive military by Congress is an implicit delegation or an implicit approval of the right to start hostilities on the part of the president, then in the end, we, we agree. Because I think the primary check on the president's powers is in this area of foreign affairs is the funding power. And Congress, as you know, has had many opportunities to cut off funding for any of the different conflicts we've had since 1945. And they've chosen not to use it. At the time of the 18th century and until 1945, the funding power was a perfect check on the president. Because we did not have any significant standing military of any kind. If you wanted to have, if the president wanted to take us into war, he would have to go 
to Congress and ask the Congress to build him or her a military to fight that war. And then usually we would demobilize the military shortly thereafter. It's only after 1945 we've had this world of a permanent large standing military that's designed to fight at a moment's notice abroad. If Congress didn't want that to be the case, they could easily design and structure the military to be more defensive, or they could choose not to create any significant offensive military units at all and require the Congress to come to the president and seek approval for funding and creation of the military beforehand. So in the end, I'll say, I think actually John and I, I, I think, would agree actually about the constitutionality of everything from President Trump's recent use of force in Syria or his maybe threat to use force in North Korea or President Obama's use of force in Libya and Syria. It sounds to me like we all agree because I would say Congress has chosen not to use uh, the power of the person to cut those wars off. John would say he thinks that implicitly we use, we, the Congress has already pre-approved those uses of force through the creation of the military. Right. So, thanks. Right. Thank you very much. Um, so I was going to start. I think there are two separate points that are largely made, and I'm wondering how you're going to respond to it. The first is a textual one, which is you have the war power, so to speak, of states specifically mentioned. And the, the anticipation there is that they would not be able to do this without congressional permission. Why is that language? not coterminous with the declare war clause. And this is a textualist argument, and I'm wondering what your response is to that. And yeah. Don't worry, I haven't abandoned textualism. <laughs> and, and as for which copy of the Constitution to use, using the, using the Lexus Nexus Constitution means that I'm a tool of the corporate fat cats. <laughs> so I think that's, that's, that's OK. And the, the difference between Article 1, Section 10, and Article 1, Section 8, is that Article 1, Section 10 is imposing limits on the states from, as you might say, the outside. That is to say, it's not dealing with the internal allocation of authority within the state governments. That's not something that <clears throat> the federal constitution largely is concerned with. It is simply saying, here's the bottom line. Here's what you're allowed to do. Here's what you're not allowed to do. Whereas the whole point of Article 1, Section 8 and the allocation of the powers more generally is to create a complete system of government. The agendas are very different for most of the Constitution, which is from the inside saying who gets to do what, than the agenda with respect to the states, again, being treated from the outside. And one, ref one reflection of that, and one, uh, can, can I say two things? And, uh, thank you. Um, one reflection of that is there are, as, jo as John Yu noted, there are a number of congressional war powers, including in, in, in particular, the power to create and fund the military. One thing about the understanding of the power to declare war that I've suggested is that it harmonizes those provisions. And in particular, it doesn't require an explanation of the anomaly. Congress, why would Congress have this quite blunt tool through the appropriations power, blunt in the sense that it can be used by determining the shape of the military forces? And it can be used in the, in the, in the very bludgeon-like mode of saying no more funding for anything. Why would rational constitution writers give Congress that, those really blunt tools and not give Congress something that is more nuanced? For example, general control over whether a use of force is on behalf of the United States. Whereas if you think the framers did that in the declare war clause, then the different pieces of Congress's power all fit together. They're on the assumption that Congress ultimately is in charge of this, and that's why Congress has the power to declare war, the power to structure and create the forces, the power to create rules for the government of the forces, the power to fund the forces and not fund the forces. They all fit together rather than having a hole in the middle, which is the authority to determine what they're for and when they can be used. So John, I had a question. I mean, you said, look, you're... Which one? You, you, John, that maybe this goes to your the analogy that the implicit authorization John Harrison endorses is the same what I would call as a funding power that you endorse now and you said the way to think about this is ex ante if the funding has been provided maybe for some kind of standing force 
in your view, that's a funding power that could meet the implicit authorization uh, uh, notion that uh, John Harrison endorses. But one would wonder whether or not the way that you envision this funding power is that most of its, if you want to call it, most of the force of it comes ex post. There's a world, you can imagine a world where most of these things had to be pre-approved in the sense that you're about to go to war and Congress has to raise the funds. But once they've raised the funds for a standing army that is under the command of the president, yeah. then it seems under your framework, the only time when this is really triggered is ex post. Is that a fair characterization? Is there a way it could be triggered ex ante? I'm, gl I'm glad you asked that because that I think brings up a deeper philosophical difference perhaps between where John uh, Harrison is and I, which is I think uh, your question makes a lot of sense when we think about domestic affairs in the administrative state, where we like to have Congress approve and authorize things ex ante, and then the president you know, faithfully executes the laws set out in policy by Congress, and then you have oversight and you review and you uh, adjust policy in response. I think, though, in foreign affairs, the Constitution reverses the polarity of that basic setup. That, and this is why uh, there is something called the executive power, and there, that's why it's worth looking at the thinkers uh, preceding the framing about the executive. And in those situations, you know, you totally could start, I think, with uh, Machiavelli for any uh, hidden Straussians out there, um, who, uh, you know, Harvey Mansfield has this great book about the meaning of executive power. He traces the idea of the modern executive to Machiavelli. And the idea is that uh, there are certain situations which arise, which are not predictable, which can't be foreseen by legislation, and the executive has to act first. Uh, and you know, you go from Machiavelli <clears throat> to be like Locke, particularly even Montesquieu. What is the primary area where you see that kind of situation arise? Foreign affairs and war. So I would say if one of the reasons to, that the framers created the presidency, you look at the Federalist Papers, look at Federalist Number Seventy, uh, and look at Hamilton's defense of the executive. Right? It's almost borrowed from Machiavelli through Locke. This idea that. Unforeseen situations, particularly in foreign affairs, will arise. The president is the body of government in being. It, the president will respond immediately on behalf of the country first. That's very different than the ex ante model of domestic policy. Instead, Congress's role, the legislature, which is hard to organize, sometimes may not even make come to a decision at all, will be more ex post. Because the need for the country to act first immediately is so important, that the framers, right, they're concentrating authority in the executive. They're willing to accept the idea the executive might make mistakes, but in exchange, the president can act right, with swiftness, decisiveness, secrecy, and speed. And that that's a value that's more important than maybe 100% accuracy, which would come through from deliberation by the legislature beforehand. Now, I, I, I guess in this, I'm going back and forth in the, the, these arguments, I'm wondering, Regardless of what you think the boundaries are, and John, I wanted to start with you. Imagine that someone comes in, and let's say it's a court, and they say, we buy John Harrison's vision. Um, how are they able, right, if it's a court, who's going to be the interpreter? Does your model require that the court be aggressive in policing these things? Does it require that Congress, does it require that the president, him or herself, have internalized these norms. Um, what's, what, what are the predicate conditions for this to work? Because the reason why I ask is that even if I chose your model and you say this is a model of statutory interpretation, who's doing the interpreting? If it's the president who's doing the interpreting, then we look at past historical experience of how presidents have interpreted this. And if they interpret it very robustly, one may wonder where are the lines? They're interpreting it very, very aggressively. Uh, everybody's deferring to their interpretation. Um, it looks like your vision may collapse to John's vision, which is that there are really no, what I would call external constraints of the presidents here, other than their goodwill to interpret this in a narrow or expansive way. So can you give some context as to how this ought to be policed? Yeah, I don't, I don't wanna sound like it's turtles all the way down. Right. But I'm, go I'm, going to, I'm going to say that that too is a question of statutory construction in the, in the following respect. I think that Congress, if it wants to, can set up a structure, and the question then, have, have they done so? But I think if they want to, they can set up a structure in which there is an important role for the courts. Uh, 
because Congress can say, and again, one of the problems with Congress is they can always act explicitly or almost always act explicitly or implicitly. They can say that orders that are con by the president that are contrary to authorization are, are unlawful and hence need not be obeyed. And, the, and, and that would raise issues that can be litigated. Indeed, people are trying to litigate them right now. Um, for example, a, a member of the military refuses, a, refuses an order he thinks is illegal, um, is, is prosecuted before a court martial for that, and would have the defense know it was an illegal order and, and, I, don't have to, and I don't have to obey it. Um, so that, that, that mode is available to Congress, and that would give the courts an important role. Um, there, are, there are cases from the 19th century in which private people who had been harmed by the use of force by the United States military brought old style officer suits. That is to say, they sued relevant members of the military and of the executive for private damages. And the question was, is the defense of combatant privilege available or not? Was this authorized on behalf of the United States? I think Congress, with its control over the availability of combatant privilege, can, if it wants to, bring in the courts. Or Congress can also create the structure in which, from the outside, it's as if everything that the president has ordered is lawful, and the constraints are all internal and perhaps by impeachment. So I think that, too, is up to Congress. I think it's fine for them to create the structure in which, again, familiar from the 19th century, in which the courts do have an important role. So John, I, maybe going back to this question, same different perspective is, what, let's assume that that does happen. And let's say it's very specific. Congress has provided maybe private rights of actions to specific individuals, maybe even individuals of the armed forces to bring certain kinds of claims. And they've specified this is how the conflict ought to take place. Naval deployments are not allowed. Air deployments are uh, your authority to do this expires in 40 days. You have to. So Congress is very specific in its delegation. That's, and it wants there to be judicial, if you want to call it oversight. And it's clear. Let's say it's textually clear. In your reading, what are the boundaries? When is it that the president can just swat Congress away and say, look, I have a commander in chief power. All, I have an all the time, of course. <laughs> I have an executive power here. You can't do this because you can't micromanage the commander in chief power this way. I mean, when, yeah. when does that happen? And when do you think they can do it? Yeah, so I, uh, uh, two points. Uh, one is, I think this is a very uh, hard question about how far Congress can go with funding riders. And I don't think it's unique to the war powers debate. All of us who uh, write about or think about the administrative state, for example, this is a big issue. Although generally, it seems riders uh, are usually upheld. It's, I don't think there's a court decision yet where the court, uh, the, uh, certainly not the Supreme Court, but only the lower courts where they say, Congress went too far in that spending rider and so the agency can ignore it. Although I think under uh, the Reagan administration, again, Harrison circa 1980s, uh, I think there's an OLC opinion from the 80s when the Reagan Justice Department did consider the idea of disobeying congressional riders on the idea that you can't use riders so far as to basically assume control of the executive power. But I don't think that opinion that I've seen you know, or any court decision has identified the line. I would say at some point we'd have to look at what the original uh, scope of the commander in chief power was, I would think it is to make strategic and tactical decisions with the military that you have. And so I would say, you know, if Congress were to say, uh, we're going to give you 13 aircraft carriers, you can't use them in World War II to go to war with Japan, or Europe first, you have to go after Japan. I think that might intrude into the commander-in-chief power, because that's still the power to make tactical strategic. I have to say, this is an area that no one in, I think, legal scholarship has really covered very well. The second point, this more directly responds also to the idea John has. Uh, I, I would worry about whether giving uh, any military officer, all the way down to a private, the right to disobey an order from the president because they think it's illegal under constitutional law might itself undermine the commander chief power to control the military. I don't disagree that Congress could create a criminal cause of action under the Uniform Code of Military Justice to give rise to court martial cases uh, or some such, but or you can make it a defense to a court martial, I guess. But uh, this was brought to mind uh, by the uh, congressional hearings where the head of the uh, US command in charge of our nuclear deterrent uh, 
was, saying, uh, was asked whether he would obey an order from President Trump to launch an attack. And he said, well, I'd have to, right, I'd have to consider whether it was a legal order. So I think this would really strike at, uh, it would really undermine the idea of making the president commander in chief. Do you want uh, us to have potentially a nuclear attack on its way to the United States? And President Trump says, you know, launch the missiles and the head of the you know, strategic command saying, well, let me think about whether we, Congress has declared war or not, which would give me legal authority to respond. Otherwise, I can't do it because it's a legal order. I think that would undermine discipline within the military. Uh, and actually, and I think that's one of the purposes of the commander in chief clause is to maintain civilian control of the military. So again, I think, I think that you would have uh, these kinds of conflicts, either funding or the criminal, uh, the rule, the the power to create the rules for the governance of the military. But on a case by case basis, I can't tell you what the exact line is. I don't think anybody has uh, figured that out. But if I had to identify a line, I would say that uh, you know basically Congress shouldn't be able to use the, the criminal, its criminal justice powers in the military that way to essentially undermine tactical and strategic control. And I don't think it can use the funding power that way either. Tom, can I, let me ask you about the interpretation going back again. Would you distinguish between, if there's a delegation issue, delegation in foreign affairs and war powers, where somebody may argue that there's concurrent authority by both the president and Congress, and the, con and the president is trying to you know, construe some war powers resolution to fight terrorism and whatnot. Would you say that the level of deference there ought to be different um, than let's say the deference that would occur let's say in domestic legislation where maybe the president doesn't have concurrent authority? And if, it's, if, the, if you think there's such deference, that is how far would you take it? What are the outer boundaries to that interpretive deference? Two, two points there. First, I think, and um, John, you made a really good point about how much are the war and foreign affairs powers and the separation of powers with respect to those two like the domestic relationships. And a large part of what I think about the particular thing we're talking about is that military and domestic operations are basically in the same structure. There is a law-bound executive. Everything the executive is doing is in some sense predicated on a statute for the military operations. It's the statutes that create the armed forces. And in those, in those, in those circumstances, I don't think principles of deference are any different domestic, as between domestic and military operations because I think they are fundamentally the same. It's the same kind of what I would call the Whig style executive. John talked about different ways of thinking about the executive historically. The one that I think best matches the Constitution is what 18th century Americans who called themselves Whigs would have thought was theirs. And I think there it's the same one, fundamentally law driven and law bound, both domestically and, and, and with respect to military matters. And I don't, and I don't think that there are any presumptions of, de of deference. I think all of those would have to be identified at a lower level of abstraction than the Constitution. Having, having to do, I, I think a lot of this, what Congress has done in statutes always has to be understood in terms of what's gone on in the last 200 years. Those are sound principles of statutory construction. And so there might be strong deference to the president for reasons of reading contemporary statutes in the light of longstanding practice. I think questions may be a little bit different for non-defense foreign affairs where I would say, and I'm not gonna, I'm gonna get into the details on this, I would say that there, as opposed to the military situation, there are some constitutional defaults in favor of presidential power, but they're, but they're largely defaults. That is to say they can be overridden by Congress when Congress has an applicable enumerated power that can control what the president does with respect to foreign affairs. Maybe in a situation like that, I'm not sure what I think, maybe in a situation like that, the second order questions, do, 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 do the courts defer to the president would be different where the constitutional default is, as I say, I think a little different. But yeah, in the military and domestic situations, I think they are fundamentally, those are fundamentally the same kinds of questions. All right, John, you have- Make a to quick comment on John's point, which is, uh, it would be the height of irony from the framers' perspective if the president were to get anything less than the deference that courts give to the administrative state now. 
and I would think they would want it to get more. And the reason why is because if you were the 18th century framers, what would be the greater aberration in the constitutional structure? Uh, you know, the president carrying out military tax abroad or the administrative state. Right? I would think they would be shocked at this administrative state we have. And where did the administrative state come from? It was, right, if you think uh, back to a sort of Woodrow Wilson and maybe even before that, people taking uh, the modes of mobilization for war in foreign affairs and applying it to domestic affairs and carrying with it all these constitutional doctrines of deference to the executive that you see in the prize cases, for example, and claiming that they ought to apply to domestic policy. And I think that's the greater constitutional aberration in the way we have the world today, is this vast administrative state funded largely by Congress with a lot of the policymaking authority actually wielded by agencies. The sole check is really the funding power and controlling appointments, mostly done ex ante. I mean, I'm sorry, ex post. But I think the reason why that is such an aberration is because what Wilson and uh, constitutional progressives did is they took the modes and forms of the wartime government, led by a commander in chief and an executive and a, a Congress act, acting ex post, and they shoehorned it into domestic affairs where it was never really meant to. So I think at the very least, you would expect the president to get the same level of deference that courts give to the Ministry of State, and arguably he should get, I would say, more. Can I ask a question about the basic declaration of war similarity to authorization kind of dilemma uh, situation that we often face? I mean, I could imagine that uh, back in the 19th century, when you're talking about declaration of war, one of the functions that they were worried about is triggering certain kinds of international laws of war that it served. Uh, and this wasn't just true for the United States. This would be true for any civilized power that was going to war. You announce this, and it triggers humanitarian law of war, et cetera. That humanitarian law has expanded extensively. Some people have argued that declaration of war as a norm has gone down as international humanitarian law has expanded, partly because some folks want to escape uh, the risk of being bound by uh, international humanitarian law. But l let's think about it this way, because we have actual cases that courts have dealt with. Uh, let's assume that you have an international law of war governing blockades, which a lot of people were concerned about. When is it that you can institute a naval blockade? And let's say you didn't declare war, and you didn't authorize war, and the president has instituted a naval blockade in the Korean Peninsula or something like that, that would be something that international law folks would care a lot about. International laws of war cares a lot about that. But I'm thinking from the perspective of judicial capacity in the United States, I can't imagine a court trying to say, look, we're going to try to make a determination whether a blockade of the Korean Peninsula is legally appropriate, right? There may be no American citizens whose lives, whose properties are at stake. No rights are gonna be deprived. It's whether or not you can circle the Korean Peninsula and blockade it. I can understand that courts would be reluctant to go down that road. And I can understand that courts may be more willing if you seize the property of an American citizen in Korea, or if you detained an American somewhere in San Diego because the president thinks that this person may be a combatant, that they may be more invested in intruding, partly for functional reasons. But those functional reasons do not map clearly onto this formal structure you've set up, I think. Do you agree or don't agree? <laughs> I, I think I think they don't they don't map perfectly, but that there are but that there are connections. And the first the first thing I want to say about that is, and I mentioned this briefly when we when we started. I I think that the easy part about general and prospective authorization for presidential use of force is about international humanitarian war, law. Is about those parts of the law of war that are specifically about relations between combatants. And I'm not sure what I think about other parts like the blockade. And good, good to bring up the, the blockade. Other situations where the international law of war matters that are, that are less important these days than they were in the 19th century in part. It's really important to understand the massive changes in international law that the UN Charter brought about by eliminating the state of war and replacing it with 
self-defense and Security Council authorized uses of force, and replacing things like blockades with Security Council authorized economic sanctions. International law is very, is very different. Um, and so what I think about the now much less important questions about things like blockades, very important in the 19th century, see the prize cases, and whether Congress would have to act specifically to a conflict, I'm not sure. Now, I think there's a reason that on that issue, the prize cases was five to four. I think that's, I think that's, I think that's hard. But to get back to the prize cases, although I think there are difficulties with working through, and this is one of the things you were asking about today, I think, working through exactly how judicial enforcement would work here, given you know, the way international law now inter interacts with United States domestic law. I think one thing that's striking about the 19th century is the willingness of courts to treat these the way they treated these questions, the way they treated other questions of law that came before them when they had proper parties before them. And I think a lot of the what we would think of as, as well, the court shouldn't get involved in that are because sometimes there is no proper party, like there's nobody who's got private property at stake as uh, the, the, way the, the way the parties in the prize cases did. But when there was a proper party, in the middle of the Civil War, the Supreme Court of the United States decided the prize cases. John, do you have any response? Yeah, I, I think um, the best argument against the, uh, the view I set out is, is related to what you said, which is if you have this view that the president is exercising authority subject to Congress's funding power or the president is uh, exercising an implicit delegation through uh, the creation of this big military, then you've, what you've done is you've read the declare war clause into nothing. Right? Like you don't need the declare war clause in either of these situations. Or you, it could be absent from the Constitution and things would pretty much still work uh, the same. I don't think that's a reason to actually have to read the declare war clause to have a broader purpose than it originally did. So I think originally you look at it, it seems to me this system worked rather well. The president could want to go to war but he couldn't unless he could get Congress to build the military for that war. And then Congress also controlled this kind of juridical function of declaring the legal state of relations between the US and another country. As John said, the creation of the UN Charter, the idea that we don't have wars of aggression anymore, uh, the fact that you have these existing international humanitarian treaties which set out the rules for combat, means that the things that the declaration of war used to do in the 18th century are obsolete or irrelevant now. But that doesn't mean, it seems to me, as a matter of constitutional interpretation, we still have to give meaning to the declare war clause and therefore you know, broaden its function. I mean, we don't, I mean, well, size here, Sai really thinks the port preference clause is really important for some reason. But you know, we don't spend a lot of time thinking about the port preference clause and the ban on states doing you know, import export regulations. They might have been important in the 18th century. But today, we don't really, you know, they're not that important anymore. That doesn't mean I would say we should go back and somehow expand their meaning and their influ influence uh, in, the in our constitutional law today. They're just, you know, they're anachronistic. And so we don't really need to, we don't really need to pay attention to them as much as they would have in the 18th century. Sure. Yep. Uh, two things. First, again, this isn't a functional argument. This is an original meaning argument that the king's war power had two components that both of the components were transferred to Congress in the, power, in the power to declare war. And it's not trying to adapt the power to declare war to make it important in the 21st century. It's no, that was in it in the 18th century. The other thing I wanna, I, I, I wanna say about sort of practical implications of this is, yeah, um, to, 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 some, to some extent, a lot of things are just gonna be governed by general delegations. I do wanna say, again, that one implication of what I've said and what I, the way I think about the Constitution of the power to declare war is the 60-day limitation in the War Powers Resolution is clearly constitutional. And I, th I, th I, think, I think that's important. And we saw a president recently who had to try to wiggle out of that. And so I think that's a significant ex-ante limitation that Congress has imposed, along with, I would say, a lot of implicit ex-ante permissions. I would, just describe, I would say the 60-day clock would be meaningful if it was attached to any kind of funding. Right. I don't think it's it needs not. to do that. Right. It's just a declaration. Right. So that's, that's a point yeah. on which we differ. Yeah. And uh, you know, none of the other branches seem to think it matters either. <laughs> I mean, the, you know, the, there's been no court that's enforced a 60-day requirement. Presidents don't seem to think it's, and Congress won't even enforce it. I mean, Congress could, right? Senator, uh, Congressman Tom Campbell tried to enforce it, tried to get Congress to cut off funds for the Kosovo war when it went beyond 60 days. He tried to file a lawsuit in court, 
nobody was interested in forcing a provision. I would say because unless it's attached to funding, it doesn't have any real uh, force or meaning to it. Could I, could I ask a question? I mean, I know we're going to turn over to the audience, <laughs> uh, but one of the things, and this, this whole thing about the 60-day issue triggers this. I can imagine from a purely textualist, formless reading, you could say, look, this has been specified. It's within, I think, part of Congress's declare war powers includes these kinds of, uh, and then you bring in the funding limitation. But let's say from a functional perspective that it's very difficult from an operational perspective for the president to conduct these kinds of use of force of operations that we think may be from an effective, functionally effective perspective when these kinds of provisions hang over his or her head. And Congress also agrees to this, like whatever the members of Congress. That is, they look at this and they say, well, we put this in there. And if it were really, really something we didn't like, then it would be triggered. Otherwise, we will safely kind of ignore it. And if it's breached, we will kind of turn the other way. Then you get into a situation where I, I think you would be worried that you have a legal regime that is a little bit so watered down because it's ra rarely ever honored that you know people are going to be skeptical or any kind of thing that the president throws in. They may, he may say, look, this is no longer the use of force, their troops under force, you know, whatever, it's not really hostilities, et cetera, et cetera. To wiggle out of it will be endorsed by the other branches. And, and my sense is, is there, is there a concern that you don't want the rule of law to feel so watered down that nobody really is buying into what it's doing or intended to do? I, I think, Gide, I think you've identified a serious pathology in the, in the way war powers questions are in practice treated in the government and, and, in, and, in, and in particular an unwillingness on the part of most members of Congress, I think, ser seriously to think through this problem and seriously to think through what exactly they want to do about it. And yes, it is, it is, re it is really bad to have in what's supposed to be a government of laws a lot of winking and nodding on the part of the people who are supposed to be following the laws, including a lot of the people who made the laws when they are, when they are not, not being followed. This uh, war powers is a high profile situation where that happens. It's by no means the only situation where that happens, but it is a, it is a serious pathology of government. I, I, I'm not surprised that this is, the things have come to the state because it's exactly what's happened with the administrative state. All these, these criticisms you have of the way war powers work would be equally appropriate with the administrative state where you have congressmen and congresswomen, they vest vast delegations of authority to the executive branch. Why? They don't want responsibility, right? And so they are happy to have the executive branch make these choices and they can criticize them if it turns out badly. They can say they cooperated if it turns out well. It's not surprising you would see this in uh, war powers too. Uh, I'll, I'll tell a, a small story here. So. Uh, uh, I was in the Office of Legal Counsel in uh, 2002 when uh, the country was deciding whether to go to war in Iraq. And you might remember Congress ended up uh, voting and approving an authorization to use military force in Iraq. And so when the question first came up and we were wondering what was Congress going to do when it drafted the authorization, well, they did the only sensible thing you would do. They called the Office of Legal Counsel to draft it for them. So we drafted them the authorization to use military force and gave it to them to pass. Then I, I remember this experience where a very high-ranking senator uh, had me and uh, someone from the White House Public Office come over to explain to him what the meaning of the words were in the authorization, which he was allegedly introducing and was gonna vote on. And I'll never forget the words. He said, uh, why are you making us vote on this, <laughs> right? Well, we're not making fun. Well, you're Congress. You know, I used to work for the Senate. It's up to you whether you even want to vote on it or not. But it's very typical of, why, of the situation today. But it's also typical of the administrative state, too. So I, I agree with John's criticisms. You apply them to domestic affairs. But I think, at least in foreign affairs, that's the way the framers thought it would turn out. All right. Uh, I just wanted to see if we can open it uh, to the audience. If uh, folks want to come up, uh, if you don't mind, I think I think the preference is that they use the microphone. Yeah. So yeah, let's because we're trying to get it recorded. Yeah, and I turn the microphone around. Okay, no problem. Yeah, and so uh, if 
Yes, thank you very much. I just, you know, if you don't mind, uh, just say your name, ask a question, and we can go with it. Uh, Earl Maltz from Rutgers Law School. I have a half-formed thought question. How does all of this fit in if we're thinking about the, the late 18th and 19th century with the rule of In re Ross, which held that the Constitution has no effect outside the borders of the United States? As well, I'm thinking of that, it would be that perhaps this, even assuming that John was right, it this is John. <laughs> Oh, white. Of course, John. John's right. <laughs> Both John's right. John's always John, right. John's, yeah, somebody's right up there. Uh, we can use a lot of John. Uh, but uh, it would be enforceable only with respect. Now, I'm not aware, I, I'm not familiar with the cases that you talked about, John H. So I'll, I'll have to defer to you on that. But if the general rule of In re Ross also applied here, it would be enforceable only against something that was done within the ter had an impact within the territorial borders of the United States. And, I, and so it would have no impact with respect to orders that were issued to people outside the territorial borders of the United States. So that's, I'm sorry if that's a half-formed thought, but that's as good as I got. I, th I, think, I think that and I don't, Earl, I don't, I don't have a fully worked out account of sort of the territorial effects of the Constitution, which is a hard, which is a hard question. But I, but I do think that there are parts of the Constitution, and the war powers are clearly examples of this, that are designed to interact with international law, including the parts of international law that affect private rights. And for those parts, I don't think there's a problem with their affecting things that happen outside the United States. For, for example, Little against, however it's pronounced, Barame. I've never been sure. Does anybody have a view on that? But a, a, da a damages action brought against a US naval officer. Question was, had he exceeded the authorization given by statute? And the courts treated that the way they would have treated a lawsuit by somebody whose door had been broken down by a US marshal whose warrant was maybe valid, maybe not. So I think in, I think in, the, in, those, in those situations, the fact that a lot of this is going to take place extraterritorially would not, in the 18th and 19th century, have, have, have been a barrier to ordinary private rights-based litigation. Actually, your question also uh, brings up something we didn't really talk about, which was the um, other dimension of the declaration of war. We have focused on this international law importance and how it set the legal relations between, say, US and France in the quasi-war. but. Uh, uh, legal authorities at the time, uh, you know, Blackstone and so on, also talk about the declaration of war having a domestic effect too. So once there's a declaration, then certain powers of the government domestically grow broader. So uh, like the Third Amendment talks about that, right? You know, like quartering soldiers and houses and things like that. Um, also, Congress could also key different delegations of authority to the president on the presence of a declaration of war. And there are still important powers uh, in the U.S. Code, which only are activated for the president if there's actually a declaration rather than you know, just hostility starting. So those would still be, I think, uh, justiciable. I think, uh, what, in a way, what you have in mind is, uh, when you were asking your question, um, is something that's always, I think, come up because of the Youngstown Steel and Tube case, which talks about President Truman seizing the, tr the steel mills within the U.S. in Ohio because of a state of war and even though the court says uh, they won't allow that and they take and they find the case justiciable, they pretty clearly say we're not talking about reviewing what Truman's doing in the theater in Korea. Uh, they don't, they just don't, they don't, at least they don't seem to think their jurisdiction goes that far. So I think actually even Youngstown, she's still, which is probably the height of Supreme Court defense of congressional powers of war, still I think tracks this kind of line you're trying to draw. Jonathan Mitchell, I'm a visitor at Stanford. A two-part question for John Yu. Would the 60-day clock in the War Powers Resolution bind the President if it were phrased as a restriction on spending money from the Treasury? And shouldn't we, as a matter of statutory interpretation, 
interpret the language in the War Powers Resolution, I think it says, shall terminate hostilities. Doesn't that logically entail a prohibition on spending money from the Treasury on the prohibited hostilities? So I, I agree with the, your, the implication of the first question, Jonathan, that if uh, Congress could just say, we're not going to allow any money out of the Treasury after you know, uh, June 30th, 2018, to the Defense Department to pay for this list of things. Uh, I think that's perfect. I think that's something we see in the administrative state all the time. They seem fairly effective. I, 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 um, you know, the people uh, criticize us because they don't think Congress would ever do it. You know, there's this argument, oh, you're cutting off the troops in the field. No Congress would actually do that. I think that might be a political problem with it, but I don't think that's a constitutional defect in the funding power. And then your second point, I don't know whether, whether it's appropriate to read the War Powers Resolution 68 clock as a bar on appropriations. Right? So I mean, you know, this is there's, you know, the difference between authorization and appropriations. Congress can and does appropriate money for functions which are not authorized in any authorizing statute. And they often say things in authorizing statutes which are never, they never get around to appropriating. And you know, there's a, that's a deeper question which I also don't think is, there's a really good Law Review article for, about this or research. I tried to find one a few years ago about what did the framers think about this authorizing appropriation divide, which we're, you know, the modern Congress works with all the time, but you don't see the framers talking about it very much. And so I always wondered whether uh, or Congress could do it. I think under modern practice, Congress could easily do that, but uh, or cut off funds or not, regardless of what's in the authorization statute. But I'm not sure what the framers would have thought of that. Thank you. Yeah. Chris Wolf, one thing that was said was that uh, this is the federal society, we should all be textualists. I agree. <laughs> and I think everybody should be a textualist, actually. But, uh, Epstein and, disagrees. <laughs> I, heard him, I heard him groan. <laughs> and as textualists, we're not supposed to play the legislative history game. But I was wondering if you'd just play it for a second. Um, apparently, if you look at the Max Farron. I think that's how Ruth Bader Ginsburg always starts out her opinions. <laughs> <laughs> look at the Max Farron you know, yeah. Philadelphia Convention records of 1787 in Philadelphia. They talked when they were writing the Declare War Clause. Uh, there's a series of three episodes, and I was wondering how each of you would explain these three episodes that happened in the series. Episode number one is, uh, or event number one is they have the original draft, and it said, Congress shall have the power to make war, not declare war, make war. You know, event number two is that one of the delegates got up and gave a speech about, well, what if America gets invaded? And then event number three is that they change it to the current draft in Article 1, Section 8 that says declare war. But originally it said make, you know, take from that series what you will, but I don't know, how would you plausibly explain what happened with the drafting? Uh, go, go ahead. Yeah, I think we both probably both have something to say about that. So. Yeah, I agree with you that we shouldn't use the legislative history, especially since right, Madison's debates are right, as well, kept secret and were not actually available to the ratifiers. And it's the ratifiers who actually right, give the Constitution legal author, authority, not you know, this cabal of Federalists who got together in Philadelphia and proposed a Constitution in violation of the authority given to them by the Articles of Confederation. Right? So I, 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 in the articles I've read, I tend to find the Philadelphia debates to be of, of less interpretive weight than other things, which even though you may have a reluctance to use legislative history, I think the debates and the ratification conventions are fair game, because those are the actual authorities that adopted the Constitution. Um, so the framers, when they were doing that, they would not have seen any of this it was originally make, which would have clearly followed then John's view of the declare war, John Harrison's view of the declare war. I don't refer to myself in the third person, although I should, yeah. So Harrison, right, he would say, if, you know, his view is, I would think, comes out the same if the Constitution had already, already said, Congress shall have the power to make war. So I think the legislative history hurts his case. But if you look at the debate, um, and so when it switches from make to declare, they're, they're confused. I mean, some of the framers say this actually makes the president weaker than it had been before, which can't possibly be right. And then some say, as you just uh, mentioned, it's actually a provision so the president can respond to sudden attacks or anticipated 
uh, attacks. But again, like we can't tell why they uh, voted on. Also, I, for some you know uh, odd reason, I actually looked up the exact date and time of this debate that occurred, and it's like Friday at 4.30 in July in Philadelphia. And as someone who grew up in Philadelphia in July, I would be like, get the hell out of there, get to the cheesesteak place. We're not spending a lot of time on this. The debate is less than five minutes, and they're all running out of time more because there's like yellow fever, I think, in Philadelphia <laughs> in July at this time, so right, they don't want to hang around. It's a classic like legislative history. Madison's notes may not even really reflect very well what happened in this one. But one last thing I just put. The other thing that Madison's debates do show is that the Constitution in its original draft form in the Virginia plan or the other plans was a heavily pro-legislative document and the president was very much a carrying out the policy views of uh, the legislature. Remember originally the president was supposed to be selected by the legislature in the Virginia plan. And over time, uh, when the framers came to questions involving the executive power, they kept broadening the presidency. And so I think it's kind of odd that this reading of the Declare War Clause is quite countercyclical to what was going on in executive power and lots of other areas outside the war power. And it's consistent with the Federalist rejection of the weak governors that existed under the state constitutions. And I think you know, quite an independent president chosen through a different electoral system with its own independent powers. I think it's odd that they would say, oh, but on the war power, we're going to really constrict the president, where in all these other areas, we're trying to expand it. Yeah, I, I, I want to add to all of the doubts that, that John Yu raised about using, in particular, what we know about the Federal Convention is we don't know that much about the Federal Convention. Madison and the other, and the other people who made notes or had their own agendas, read Mary Builder, and it's hard to figure out what went on. Maybe more important, I'll get back to this in, in a second, these were just debates, discussions, and so a lot of people thought, talked off the top of their heads. And what they said, even if Madison or whoever accurately reflected it, doesn't necessarily reflect their own careful thought, as opposed to, oh, wait a minute, somebody just said this, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say that. As for make and declare, I think in fact that declare, and notice the, the contrast between make in Article 1, Section 10, declare in Article 1, Section 8, I think that that distinction actually matches my theory, that is, Making war is a general thing that a government does. And if you're talking, again, from the outside about a state government makes a perfectly good thing. If you're talking about the Articles of Confederation where there's only one branch, it's Congress. Congress has the power to make war. That's fine. If you're trying to divide powers up and you want to give the legislative type powers of the king, one, the power juridically to change relations, two, the power through a, a, an act of law, to authorize the use of force, if you want to give those powers of the king to Congress, declare is a better word for that because it leaves out the question about who's actually going to be, you know, setting off setting off cannon. As for whoever it was said, well, doing it this way will mean that the president is, is able to respond to sudden attacks. Again, off the top of his head, I think correct, but correct because of course, any reasonable Congress is going to set up the armed forces, either explicitly or implicitly, so that they can respond to sudden attacks. That's easily understood as a matter of statutory construction. The last thing I'll say in response to what, what John said about how the president got stronger and more independent in the course of the federal convention, that's right, but those, most of those strengthenings are clearly reflected in the text. For example, moving the treaty power, quite explicitly and unmistakably, from the Senate to the President with the advice and consent of the Senate. You can't miss that, whereas where they ended up with, as to the military powers are, the power to declare war and all those other powers in Congress, and making the President simply the highest admiral and general, just a military commander, in a time when they knew that military commanders were bound by the law. Uh, I have a question for e e each of the Johns. Um, and I think for John Harrison, I think I would follow with where J.J. left off. If you imagine a president who knows that a particular action, not military in nature in and of itself, but would provoke some sort of violent response, say the president, say President Trump suggests to his son-in-law to go visit Jerusalem and go pray on Temple Mount. 
And he knows that because there's a history that what kind of response it might provoke, and because the son-in-law will come with a secret service and other armed agents, they will then respond in kind and potentially escalate very quickly. And he's doing it precisely for the purpose to trigger that military response. Is that, does that potentially, you know, does, does the sending of Jared Kushner there in, on its face being a civil action, but with a certain particular uh, thing in mind, is that, would that be sort of illegal because, you know, he's itching for war, but it's, you know, he's not doing it through military, or will Congress have to authorize that, and if so, where sort of the line is? And then for John Yu, um, you've suggested that, look, Congress can always cut off funding, and so I was just wondering, do they have to do it explicitly saying no money shall be used, or can they do it silently by just not authorizing money? And the reason I think that's important, and maybe perhaps that's contrary to the original uh, approach to the Constitution, is that every so often we have government shutdowns, but the president says, well, these are, what, what are they, what's the word that they use? Essential, Essential personnel, right? Including all the military. They have to keep showing up. And if they're in the field of battle, they have to keep fighting because they're essential, no matter that Congress has not provided the money. So does Congress have to actually explicitly say, not a penny shall be spent except to bring him home or whatever else? Well, I, I will leave it to John Yu to explain the Anti-Deficiency Act <laughs> and, its, and its exceptions. <laughs> um, but yeah, on the, on the question of pres presidential provocation, for example, President Polk setting off the Mexican War by taking a pr provocative move with the US military for which Lincoln then uh, criticized him. Yes, I think that Congress acting in, in advance has substantial authority to limit that. It's hard to, it's hard, it's hard to do because you know, the president then gets to act kind of ex post once Congress has put the limitations in place. There are some things though that the president can do that Congress simply can't control just the president saying something. And even if he said, well, Congress said, I can't say this, so it's just me you know, not acting on behalf of the United States, he can still start a war there. <laughs> so there are, there are limits on Congress's ability to do that, both practically um, in terms of how they can write a statute and because, well, you know, somebody, the president tweets, what can you, and what can you do about it? Um, and Congress understands that from time to time and has tried to limit the president. Um, they have a lot of power to, to, to do it, but it's not so easy to exercise those powers. Where'd Greg go? Oh, so uh, I agree with your, I think the thrust of your point, which is, uh, again, I think it's why the funding power is a complete check on the president, is that if Congress does nothing and doesn't appropriate funds, military operations will not continue. Uh, the reason why you see essential personnel is because John mentioned the Anti-Deficiency Act. Congress already gives the president delegated authority to choose these certain functions, which still get to keep going, even in the absence of the proper appropriation to keep the government open. So if Congress wanted to you know, carry out its constitutional, it's not a defect of constitutional power, it's just how Congress chose to use it. Um, if Congress wanted to achieve that effect, they don't have to allow the president to right, designate certain parts of the government to keep going, even though there's no budget or no general appropriation for the year for that function. I, I, again, I think it's actually a sign of, and I think this is, John and I agree, this kind of implicit approval by Congress to let the president use the military uh, in this way. Can I interject, uh, Richard, one second? Uh, no one interjects. Absolutely no not. One, <laughs> no one interjects with Richard. No, no. <laughs> but we have until 2 p.m., Lee, is that correct? I, I just want you to don't have to go that long. No, no, I, no. I have the next 20 minutes. Yes, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> fully accounted for. No, I mean, I want to make the following statement. I think both of you are completely wrong. <laughs> and I have no idea what the right answer is. And let me see if I could explain why the general proposition, and then put one question to each of you to try to do it. The, First thing is, you're trying to talk here about the relationship between an executive and essentially a board of directors of one kind or another. You look at any private agreement and they will have pages upon pages of material uh, designed to spread out the relationship. And here what we do is we have maybe two words of direct relevance, and I agree with John Harrison that the Article 10 stuff is quite different. The horizontal relationships and the internal relationships are different question. The thought that you could get completeness out of two words on an issue that has so many different variations, I think, is, is just wishful thinking. Uh, so whether you're a textualist or a non-textualist, I think as with the law of contract, the skimpier the document, the more that has to be left for implication, which is why it is when people say that they're textualists now, I think it wildly overstates the case when texts are incomplete. 
Uh, the second point is, I think they're really powerful counter arguments to both of you, um, which means that I can't quite figure out what the right answer is. So for John Harrison, um, let me give an analogy. What happens is Robert Bork is up uh, for confirmation as Solicitor General, and the Senate announces it will prove his nomination for that position so long as he does not deal with any antitrust cases. Uh, the question is, can you attach that particular condition uh, to the appointment to an office and call it a balance in the separation of power? And as we know, there's a mortal tension between separation of powers on the one hand and balance, checks and balances on the other, because one says I could do it alone and the other says I can stop you. And we never quite know which of those two things ought to dominate in any case. But I would assume in this particular case that the condition would be void and that they would be forced to an up or down vote. Um, uh, and it's not a textual argument because the law of implied conditions is extremely difficult and that's what has to be carried over here. So when you now got to the war power, if I'm correct on this, or at least have a plausible case, the word plenary can't be right. Uh, because what you're talking about now is a situation in which what the, they say to the president is what we're going to do is we're going to authorize you to conduct this war so long as you agree never to fire Admiral Nimitz insofar as he's in charge of the Pacific Fleet. Um, I don't believe that that condition would be valid. And so the moment you get one counterexample to the plenary, you're back in messy land, uh, which says which conditions are good or which conditions are bad. Uh, there is an entire body of law, unconstitutional conditions, uh, which normally deals quite intelligently, I think, with the use of monopoly power, which has, I think, only limited application here. So I think it's just wildly optimistic to say that, and I don't have a second tier theory uh, to do this. Now, when you go to John, I, I think completely wrong again. Um, it is one thing to say that we are going to create authorization for the Vietnam War year after year and not have a declaration. But what we do is we have a very large nuclear arsenal and we've armed this for years. I would never in a billion years think that this is an authorization for the president to, to bomb North Korea or any other place without any deliberation and so forth, simply because we have the capacity. Uh, so I think that the implication is it has to be program specific under the inspection, and it cannot be generally um, used in order to make sure that the appropriations power is a check. And indeed, if the already money has already been appropriated and existing funds are sufficient to carry out the exercise, I think it's dangerous, indeed dangerous, to argue that that's an implicit operation that once the money's put over there, we have a tying arrangement, which is we now create full-time military services on the one hand, and oh, by the way, at the same time, President bombs away anywhere you want, anytime, against any, any, for any reason, without explanation or thing. So I think if each of you, these are your core commitments, right? Yours was appropriation, yours was plenary, neither of them can be correct. And that then puts me into the position of saying, well, how do you do the rest of it? I'm going to give, again, an answer which I accept and regard as incomplete. And the answer I accept is you try to kind of look at, you know, what my Trevor Morrison likes to say, my dean, is constitutional practice to fill in the gaps, as you might, I think, quite credibly do in a case like Zivotofsky. Uh, but I don't see how in the world a uh, practice which requires constant repetitive uses in similar situation is going to be able to handle the once in a lifetime types cases that arise when you've already announced that the situations that we have with military preparedness today are completely different from those of 19, 1789. So this is the bottom line. If we actually have fights like this, it's over. We will lose. The de facto rule has to be at some point or another, there is a sufficiently large consensus or the divisions will essentially cripple the United States in its external relationship. So it seems to me that what one should be doing as a pragmatic matter is trying to figure out how these people continue to talk to one another rather than trying to figure out what happens when we toot the powers. That is, A plus B we can figure out. I don't think we can figure out completely A or B. And so I think both of you, in some sense, are much too optimistic. And I'm just curious as to whether or not, with this rather long question, um, whether I am basically completely wrong-headed or just merely slightly misguided. John, you want to start? OK. <laughs> First, on the, <clears throat> on the question, how much theory does it take to deal with important but brief 
provisions in a constitution or a statute. Good question, Richard. I, I, I think you have something to say about that. Um, more, more specifically here, I don't think that what I'm suggesting is about conditions. Not at all. It is, let me get, no, it's not. Um, and let me try, let me try to use the, the Bork as Solicitor General, but he can't argue any antitrust cases as an example. No, I don't think that the Senate, in performing its consent to appointments function, can impose such conditions just because the Constitution, I think, says yes or no, and you know, it doesn't say anything about conditions, doesn't give any uh, uh, mechanism okay, it for, it, for, atta for attaching them. But what Congress can do is, by statute, say, the role of the Solicitor General is to argue cases in the Supreme Court except those having to do with antitrust because Congress's authority to make relevant rules of law is plenary in the sense that Congress is the legislature and it and not the executive makes the law. Since what I think about the power to declare war is it's the power to make certain rules of law and that none of that is in the president, I don't think that when Congress acts using that power, it's imposing a condition on what the president can do as commander in chief. Whereas there are hard questions, John was, was talking about funding restrictions. There is, there is an, OLC, an, an Obama era OLC opinion saying a funding restriction was unconstitutional and saying you don't have to follow it because they said it was an attempt to impose a condition on a constitutionally granted power, the power to conduct foreign relations. Whereas I don't think, as I say, I don't think that when Congress decides what uses of force are lawful and what aren't, they're imposing conditions on the president's uh, authority as commander in chief. No, they are establishing the legal rules within which the no. executive operates, which is which is always the relationship between the executive that and the legislature. So why, why, why do conditions have anything to do with right. it? Because now what happens is what we do is we approve Bork and we pass a statute which says that so long as the current administration is in power, uh, the uh, Solicitor General cannot enter antitrust cases. And after that, it's all done. It seems to me that what you cannot do is to take a situation where you use legislation to give you something with respect to a particular appointment, whether by name or by description, which essentially undercuts the all or nothing nature of the problem. And that's exactly what you're doing. So do you think it's constitutional to pass a statute which says, hey, uh, we are now approving Bob Bork. Next thing we pass the statute, get the House of Representatives to go along and say the Solicitor General until January 21st, 1980, is in fact debarred from doing it. And after that, it's fine. That is, that is, that is fine because- It can't be right. This has to be crazy. <laughs> Just crazy. I mean, forget about that. It's crazy. Because they got the House of Representatives to go along, because the advice and consent, because the consent no. to appointment power is distinct from the power to create offices, set up the government, that one is, and I'll use the word again, plenary. And now I have demonstrated by the mode of argument that I, I think I have redeemed myself against John Yu's claim that I am not a formalist anymore. Because what I just said no, is but, perfectly I mean, that's the formalistic. Problem is that and of course are, you don't like you, it. The problem is that you are too much of a formalist. <laughs> Richard, because but, what you're doing that's is- That's what he wants. You, you also brought up something that I think okay, with I'm respect to stand. John Yu and with respect to the funding power. I'm happy to let this go on. Uh, no, no, don't mind no, no. me. <laughs> Keep going. Uh, no, no. Beat up Harrison some more. I, I didn't do a sufficient job. Dealing with, we dealt with the plenary power. And I and I understand. Richard, that the answer may not be satisfactory because you think it's it, it, they, they can it's a get around. You get to the same yeah, it's situation. It's a circumvention principle, right? Yeah. And then what of the plenary power issue, John? What what do you think? No, not, uh, not, the not the plenary, the plenary power. power. The, 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 the funding, yeah, the funding yeah. power. So uh, actually, I've learned after we've done the podcast together over a hundred times. Don't disagree with Richard. Agree with Richard. I agree with you, Richard. <laughs> and the reason why is. Um, I actually think that a lot of this is not set out by the Constitution in its exact terms. Thank you. That, uh, in fact, the, the, the difficulty I had with the, the use of textualism and originalism in the war powers debate is that it was often used to say, the Constitution has this clear system from the text and the original understanding, and everything we've been doing since is unconstitutional. And all the practical relationships between legislatures and the executives just ought to be thrown out the window because originalism tells us something different. And I don't think that's correct here. I actually think the properties of textualism and originalism 
actually shows that most of the war powers system is subject to later development by the interaction of the president and Congress using their own power. So I actually was struck when John said, well, look at the treaty power or the appointments power, where the framers did take a formal executive power and split it up and share it between the president and the Senate. When they do that, they do it in a very specific way. Who goes first? Whose approval is necessary? Yeah. What happens later? In those contexts, treaties and appointments, like your Bork example, I think we do have a fairly specific uh, framers understanding way of how the process should work. Compare that to the, the war power. You have the, co the commander in chief power in Article 2. You have the declare war clause in Article 1. You have the funding power in Article 1. You don't have that careful step by step process for what was formerly a sole executive power under the British Constitution or the Articles of yeah. the Confederation. But even so, the treaty power is completely incomplete because the question of abrogation, modification, enforcement, Yeah, and that's so something forth. we worked out later, uh, reservations. Well, I, it's yeah. to be named later. Look, I mean, the point one wants to make is if you treat this as like a contract, essentially what happens is the explicit provision does a large part of the work, then your first obvious exceptions do a lot more of the work. Yeah. Like, for example, the emergency case. I mean, everybody agrees on that. But the moment you start getting to more complicated case, you have the following phenomenon. As the events become more exotic, you need the tools of implication, but the tools of implication become weaker uh, because the optimal solution yeah. that you can think of is a simply not unitary in the way no, that I, you want. I, and that's I, just a, a pathology we can't you. avoid. No, I agree with you. That's why I think the better reading is the Constitution yeah. vests these powers in each branch, which are not the complete control of the subject of war. They have influence on how we're going to make war. And I think the Constitution allows for variations on yeah, but I mean, ways we go to war. Uh, and they don't have to, but the Constitution doesn't say it has to be in this precise way. That's why I think Article 1, Section 10 still has value, because even though if you think it's about states and not the yeah. president versus, it does show the framers in the war context talking about specific exceptions, a specific process, and then they don't do that with the federal government. So I, I actually am at the same at the bottom line with you, which is, why doesn't the Constitution just allow this all to be sorted out by politics, given that they no, you know, one side has that, frame, one side has appropriations and one side I'm has? I'm not commander. saying like that. I think in effect there are principled arguments that are not political, but are often not conclusive. And so what it is is the question is to be put: How many shots can you take below the waterline with your particular USS Constitution and keep the ship sailing? And it turns out everybody's going to get the hit. And so the thought is that somehow you can keep your hole invulnerable while the other guy is just sleeps crazy. And in fact, I, I mean, have I, no idea what that means. Well, what happens? <laughs> what it means is we have this incomplete. I lost constitution. that about ninety seconds ago. <laughs> we, the, the, we have this incomplete constitution, and there are devastating cases that you could show that one interpretation is going to allow but you can show devastating cases that another interpretation is going to allow. So you're trying to figure out what is the relative degree of dislocation in the abstract. And what happens is, as you go far enough down there, the indeterminacy starts to take place. But you don't want to go from that to say it's pure politics. What you want to go from that is to say, well, what do we know about tools of implication in other cases to see that we can help? And so, so for why? Well, so between our two cases, our two yeah. interpretations of the Constitution, yeah. why isn't mine the superior one if you're worried about <laughs> the factors you're worried about? So say, here's a good example. Because you can blow up the universe. No, I no. Mean, that, that, that's, that's, uh, well, we're not going to do it. Trump's going to do it. Well, thank you. <laughs> no, but, but, but seriously. In the 18th century, you know, they could not foresee a world where you could launch an ICBM and yeah. immediately hit another country across the oceans almost instantaneously, yeah. right? So a system which says the Congress has funding, the president has a commander in chief, work it out how you want to handle a world with a new technology you couldn't anticipate at the time of the 18th century. I think my system allows for a fair amount of variation. Fair, I think John's so, John. is the one that says there has to be, you know, that there has to be a fixed and subtle way to do it. And unless they do it in the way he prefers, then it's got to be unconstitutional. Okay, same time next year. <laughs> so we have, we have a couple minutes, Anthony, if you okay, want to. Sure. Yeah. So Anthony Deuter, Federalist Society. What would the debaters say are the essential attributes of war as the Constitution sort of conceives of it? Is it simply sort of a technical abstract definition, some state of hostilities? And so this is the kind of thing that's simply part of the business of the state. You know, it may exist almost continuously with some country or other throughout the history of the the state and we should sort of be prepared to function 
uh, on that basis, or is it sort of an all-consuming World War II type thing where all the resources of the Republic are marshaled towards this existential threat or singular objective until sort of that, that issue is resolved? And does how one answers that question influence how we think about the allocation of powers? I, it's a good question. I think um, one thing uh, that I would, I think I disagree with John on is that I don't think courts would, should be making this decision for us. So I think one aspect of declaring war is that declaration is usually a juridical function that the courts carry out, and it's unusual you have it in the Congress. And so I think that's almost like oust, a way of ousting the courts from making those calls. Is this total war? Is this limited war? Which kinds have to be uh, declared? It's similar to the impeachment power, right, where Congress is set up as a court, and they make a judgment, and the Supreme Court and Nixon says, you know, where you know, the, the declaration, I mean, the movement of the conviction power out of the judiciary to Congress means that the courts are not going to review impeachments. So I think one level I disagree with John, and your question raises it, is that I think the declare war phrase means it's up to Congress as almost like a political question to make these choices. Um, you know, the, 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 the second point is, um, the argument that John's making, I don't know if you believe this, but traditionally uh, what they, the scholars on that side say is that uh, declare war is for what they would call perfect war, which is more along the lines of everyone in our country is at war with everyone in their country. And then these uh, other forms of war you're talking about, the framers would have called imperfect war. Uh, uh, people on the pro-Congress side of the debate say that power is given to Congress through the Markham Reprisal Clause because the Markham Reprisal Clause is you know, what they would have thought of as a limited war. I actually think that's incorrect. And again, I, I think it, it shows there's a difference between colloquial uses of the words in the Constitution versus, a, I would think, of a more technical legal use of the phrase. And Markham Reprisals were a specific form of limited war, but they were not, you wouldn't, it was not an all encompass. it's not the phrase we use to say imperfect war. So I, I'm not quite sure whether the declare war clause itself was meant to subsume all forms of hostilities. I would have thought that a certain amount are just subject to executive initiative because the Constitution, when it uses the phrase mark and reprisal, doesn't occupy uh, the field. I, I, th I think, and I think this is going to distinguish my view, as I said, my position is so pro-Congress, it's to some extent pro-president. <laughs> Going to distinguish my position from what a lot of people who sort of say the president is limited and Congress has power. I don't think that the concept, I think the concept of war is a wholly legal concept. I don't think that it is about the magnitude of a conflict. And so it, inc it includes, power, the, the Congress's power to authorize the use of force includes Anything that requires combatant immunity, basically. Anything that will be covered by the law of war in that sense, no matter how large or how small. Small incursion or total war, I don't think that difference matters. There are a lot of people who say there's a threshold there. I don't think that's right. So as I say, that's, that's, that's one of the ways in which I differ from people um, who are in some sense pro-Congress. Pro I think that it is also a legal concept in the other part of it. One part of it is authorizing the use of force and hence requiring combatant immunity. The other part of it is departing from the, from the rules that ordinarily ap apply between private people and between private people and governments, for example, by imposing a blockade. So the law of war is distinguished from the law of peace, but again, those are legal concepts and they're not about, they're not about, they're not about magnitudes. As for, so I, and I think Congress's power to create an imperfect war in general comes completely and is complete from the power to declare war. That the mark and reprisal power is there because it's a deviation from the unitary executive principle. It allows private people to carry on war on behalf of the United States to some extent which I think is a fundamental thing that the president's status as commander in chief and the distinction between the government and the government's armed forces and private people rests on. And so Congress needed a separate special power for that precisely because that departs from the general sy system of, of separated powers in which everything that's done on behalf of 
of the United States as a sovereign is done by the federal executive branch and is under the control of the president and isn't done by private people, the market and reprisal power is a, is a, variation, is, is a, is a modification of that. But the, the, the kind of imperfect war where US vessels of war are allowed to take some prizes but not others, fine, but under the power to declare war, I think. Throw in a small thing, just, I, I actually have a different interpretation of market and reprisal. It makes sense to me that's in the same clause as the declaration of war because both of those clauses are about what are the legal consequences of hostilities? But I think that's different than authorizing the start of hostilities. They're about, that's why, to me, the Declaration of Independence is a good example. You know, hostilities start a year before the Declaration of Independence. It's about what are the legal consequences of the United States and Great Britain being at war and declaring they're an independent, sovereign country. Market reprisal is very much that feature. It's an immunization of private people for conducting hostilities that would otherwise be illegal under the laws of war. But I don't think it means the president's not allowed to order people to go to war with France, which and, yeah, we I should think, be doing I all think the time. Authorization of the use of force is a change in legal relations, and so it's assimilated to those, and John doesn't think so. Yes. Well, thank you very much, uh, John Yu and John Harrison. We just talked at the end of the hour. Thank, thank you, Dave. Thank you. Good work. Thank you.